like to call to order the March 28th Town Council Special Meeting. Madam Clerk. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, all councilors are present. That's, that would be Councilors Atwater, Bumgarter, Franco, Heed, Parker, Schmidt, Zapiri, and Granitoski. Councilor Aubrey is out of town. Thank you. Would you please rise for a salute to the flag and would Mayor Hedrick please lead us in the salute. It's behind you. To the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Mayor Hedrick. At this point, I would just like to give the elected officials a chance to introduce themselves. So uh, we can start down here with the counselors, and we'll just go right around the table to the Board of Ed and Superintendent. Uh, Councilor Andre Bumgardner. Councilor Rachel Franca. Sorry, y'all. Councilor Juliet Parker. Councilor Conrad Heed. Councilor Patrice Granitowski. Councilor David Atwater. Councilor Rita Schmidt. Thank you. Councilor Joe Zapiri. Not elected, but town manager John Burt. <laughs> Kim Shepherdson, Washington, Board of Ed. Mike Renier, Superintendent. Rosemary Robertson, Board of Ed. Jane Gelini, Board of Ed. Andrea Ackerman, Board of Ed. Thank you very much. Madam Clerk. Notice is hereby given that the Groton Town Council will hold a public hearing on the fiscal year ending 2020 annual town budget pursuant to Charter 9, Section 9.3.1 of the Town Charter on Thursday, March 28, 2019 at 7 o'clock p.m. at the Groton Senior Center 102 Newtown Road, which is also Route 117, Groton. The full copy of the budget's estimates will be uh, on file, are on file, and have been on file, the town clerk's office for public inspection, as well as online at the town hall <coughs> website. This was posted uh, on the, in the New London Day on March 18th, 2019, per Charter 9.3.1. Thank you, Madam Clerk. We have two budget presentations, first from the town manager and then from the superintendent of schools. Mr. Burke. Do we have any kids that can get it? No kids? No kids. Good evening. Everybody hear me okay? I'm going to start off, uh, welcome, thank you for coming. Um, it's good to see everybody. I started off just giving a little background about the process, uh, what happens leading up to today. Um, budget dates, uh, some of the relevant budget dates, April 6th, the town council must hold a public hearing by then. That's this public hearing prior to April 6th. By April 28th, the town council has to approve their budget. 
uh, which is very short time frame, going to uh, the town, the uh, RTM from there. Uh, they start by May 3rd and have to wrap up by May 25th, and then the town council wraps up the process by setting the actual tax rate. Uh, the role of the council in the RTM, uh, my budget's the start of the process. Well, it really starts uh, a long time before then, and the Board of Education has their own process. But uh, in terms of, I'm sure you're going to want to know how numbers change from the original of this current budget. The town council can increase an appropriation for any given department um, to a figure that's above the town manager, but the RTM can only cut or reinstate the budget to the town manager's proposal. Uh, and then the, uh, that's really the two key things. Uh, leading up to the budget, what, where do I come from as I do the budget? Uh, what are our strengths here in the town? What are some of the, uh, the things we have going for us? Of course, EV, uh, electric boat, you know, we know there's a lot going on there. Try to keep that in mind. There will be new revenues coming in as they, as they build and expand. Uh, we have Pfizer, the sub base, downtown Mystic, our location, of course. We have some great economic development going on, uh, Central Hall and, and downtown Mystic, uh, a few things over in the industrial park, a lot of other things going on. And we do have high-level services, and uh, those are very valuable, and they, those do bring people to live in the town, our parks, our libraries, our roads, uh, et cetera. Um, some of the things we're facing, though, we have a lot of challenges currently and upcoming. Uh, one of the things the governor, you may have seen in the governor's proposed budget, is uh, shifting the cost of teachers' pensions to the towns. Uh, they're looking at this year about 288000 Next year, that would jump to 595000 and. Uh, my guess is once it's in there, it's just gonna, it's gonna keep escalating. So it's something that I've gotta keep in mind for the next few years for the budget. Uh, unfunded mandates, an uh, example being the uh, Public Works Depart Department, MS4, stormwater requirements, that cost us about 80,000 extra this year. Next year, that's predicted to be about 150,000 uh, and may go up from there. Uh, you may have seen Senator Looney's bill. There's several different items that could affect the town. One of them being collecting the car tax at the state level, that would cost us about $6 million. And there's several other items under there that could affect the town. Uh, I don't think that'll go anywhere, I hope, but just something to bear in mind. Um, state grant amounts are declining. We all know that. They keep on going down. At one point last year, uh, a lot of companies, we have an enterprise zone that companies, companies get tax abatements. The state's supposed to reimburse us 40% of that. At one point, they zeroed it out last year. We've never had the full 40%. At one point last year, they zeroed that out. Um, they eventually reinstated it, but it is also something I keep in mind. Uh, Groton 2020 costs, great project, you know, we're underway, it's been a real struggle and, and great job to the Board of Ed and others <laughs> involved in that. I'm sure you'll hear more on that. Um, but as that was uh, passed by the voters, that's about a two mil increase by the time it all goes on. And part of what the council, the RTM and I have to think about is, are we gonna allow the full two mils to go on or is there other things we can do to try to offset that, which means uh, more revenues or cuts. So that's something that, you know, we have to wrestle with during this budget season. Uh, alliance district status, the, the, uh, our schools are at Alliance District. The CCM, the uh, Connecticut Conference of Municipalities, just put out that if we were to leave that status right now, we'd lose $4.7 million in education funding. And in the next few years, we will eventually come off that. So that's another thing we have to keep in mind is that we will likely lose a good chunk of education dollars. Um, health care and wages, those are always going up. We try to do what we can to uh, manage health care. And we've been cutting town departments for years and years and years. Um, doing everything we can to do that without losing full services. We're at the point now, if, if, I do, if we do major cuts, we have to lose a service. Um, that's something to wrestle with too. It's either that or you let the mill, millage go up, the mill rate go up without, any of, without doing anything to stop it. Opportunities, however, we're working on retirement benefits for new employees, changing those over to get those more cost effective for the town more manageable. Um, once new benefits are in place for new employees, we'll look at uh, employee retirement incentives. Once you have the new structure in place, new people come in, and then they'll be under that modified good, good benefits, but not quite what we've had. Um, seeking efficiencies, I'm always looking for ways to restructure, regionalize, cost share. Uh, we do a little bit of our, uh, uh, cost share regionalized now. We do the uh, fire dispatch for North Stonington. I was in talks with Ledger for a little while on animal control. It didn't work out, but I'm always looking for those opportunities. And those are the best opportunities to try to save dollars. They're also about the most difficult thing to achieve. Um, over the next year, I plan to analyze departments, see where else we could possibly cut, what's mandated, what's not mandated. Uh, we'll be taking a good look at that. Again, wrestling with 
are we going to pass all mill increases on to the residents, or are we going to look at a combination of cuts, of course, increased revenue from economic development, and some increased mill rate? Uh, savings, uh, as we do the middle school and the two uh, hopefully new elementary schools, uh, we hopefully <coughs> will should have savings on closing schools, so we have to keep that in mind. That is an opportunity that will offset some of our costs, hopefully. Uh, we'll be looking at that soon. And then uh, the new tax increment financing, which not is, is not a tax to the people, the, as John Reiner would want me to point out. Um, hopefully that's going to spur development on Thames Street, Five Corners. The city's been working on that. We've been working with them. Gold Star Highway and Route 1. Um, my budget approach then. Uh, uh, I've been tasked with making recommendations on where to cut. Every year that's kind of the task. Where can we potentially cut? We've done the departments. I, I, I'm at that point where it's, it's a service cut at this point, where you'd have to completely cut out something, and that's more of a policy decision for the council. Um, we do ask the departments, though, to do three numbers to me. We ask for uh, status quo. If you're going to keep everything you've kept, present that budget to me. If you were going to give me a 0% increased budget and then give me a 5% reduction, and what would the effect of that be? So then as we go into the budget process, I'll know more. If somebody looks at cutting, I'll know what that real effect is. Um, outside agencies, uh, as I said, we've cut all the internal departments. I'm running out of places to look at. Uh, we look, we're looking at outside agencies. I am looking at that. Um, looking at ambulances and libraries, as I'm sure a lot of people are here for, 25% cut. Uh, and other charities, 10% cut, kind of weaning things off. Again, we've been doing it with departments, actual town services, things we're mandated to do for years. Um, capital improvement projects, uh, maintaining existing infrastructure, and if we're not maintaining it, then look at, do we need it anymore? Uh, health or public safety items, uh, there's sometimes just things we just need for public safety, like the radio system for this year. Uh, ADA compliance issues, we do have ADA issues in some of our buildings we're trying to address. Um, future infrastructure and programs, oh, before taking them on, I want to always look at what's the cost long term of that. Um, and then uh, fund balance, you'll see as I present the numbers, I did use fund balance this year, and I'll talk a little bit about that as we uh, get into it. Some of the highlights, the proposed budget, excuse me, let me get you here. The proposed budget is 129421737 That's an increase of about 3.5 million, or 2.8% uh, um, increase. Proposed mill rate is at a 0% at 24.17, but that's using 1.5 million of fund balance, which I don't like to do. That's not a sustainable approach. It buys us some time to make some decisions. I'd be comfortable with and the only reason we're able to do that, we hit our 15% this year for our uh, fund balance, but then we had some extra revenues this year. We had a great year in several categories, not repeat, they're not gonna be repeated. So I was able to do 1.5 million this year, but I'd be more comfortable if we could have only done 500,000. But it's something that is not sustainable ongoing and will have to be addressed. We don't have the money to do that every year. Uh, some of the, uh, the main areas of service, town operations, increase of 4.3%. Education, 1.2%, and they did a great job working on the budget and getting it down to that. They were, they were held, I'm sure they'll go into it, but they were flat for a couple of years. Capital debt service, uh, increase of 14.3%, uh, and that is mostly the, uh, the new bond. The for, we're doing the first bonds on the school project, and that's, uh, affecting, that's affecting the uh, budget by about 1.7 million this year. Uh, without that, I wouldn't have needed the 1.5, and now it's well worth it, and it's good we're doing it, and we have to do it. But it does have an effect on the budget. I had you know, that 1.5 million wouldn't have been needed without that first bond issuance. But again, well, well needed for the school system. Um, outside agencies reduction at 3.8 percent. Subdivisions um, up 2.9 percent. Contingency down 22 uh, percent. And that's really a lot of that's affected by how many union contracts we have for the year. And we we had to settle several this year, so uh, it, we're putting it down a little bit for next year. Um, some of the significant individual department changes, uh, executive management, that's my department, the town manager's department, reduction of 13%. Uh, uh, re uh, as a person retired, I'm not replacing that person. Information technology up 5.1%. A lot of that's to do with some new systems going in. There's some overlap of the, uh, of the uh, maintenance on them, on the old system and the new, so that'll come down a little bit next year. Finance, 9.8%. Public safety, 2.6%, um, and those are big, big budgets. You're talking 216,000 public safety, 5.6% for public works, which is about 323,000. Planning and development, 6% um, or uh, 80,000. Human services, they have a, they, uh, 
came in at a reduction of 4.9 percent. Uh, Marge did a good job there. Parks and Rec, 3.4 uh, percent increase. So all the other the town departments proper, 3.6 uh, percent increase by 847,000. Insurance, insurance is always something we wrestle with. Uh, Bob Zagami, our HR director, has done a good job. We just got our last bargaining unit, our last union, onto the high deductible health care plan. Uh, without that, we probably would have been, well, probably in the, you know, anywhere 12, 15 percent increase on health care, but by changing over to the new plan, we were able to keep that to 7.9 percent, which is really good for health care. Um, so we were lucky to do that, and it's uh, controlling things, and so we're always looking at what we can do there. Overall, town operations are up, as I mentioned earlier, 4.3%. Now, where do we compare statewide at this point, or at least in the last couple of years? We are low compared to most municipalities for our mill rate. Uh, our expenditures per pupil, ours is about 15,813. The uh, average is 16,564 and the median 17,000. So we're the uh, 117 out of 169, meaning 116 towns have a higher expenditure per pupil than us. Tax levy per capita, um, also below. We're 142 out of 169, so 141 towns have a higher tax levy per capita. Ours is 2,100, the uh, average is 2,900. And then equalized mill rate, we're 140 out of 169, 139 towns have a higher rate. Um, the average is, ours is uh, equalized mill rate is 16.77, the average is 19.42. And for actual mill rate, we in this immediate region, only North Stonington, last I looked, had a higher one, than, or lower one than us. Um, Again, part of though that using fund balance has maintained, uh, helped us maintain that millage, the mill rate for this year. It's something we're going to have to wrestle with. Hard decisions will have to be made. But, um, but all in all, we've done good over the years. But we have a lot of challenges coming up over the next three or four. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Burke. Dr. Grenier? Thank you. Actually, I'm going to set you up. Actually, John, um, uh, actually, Dr. Grenier is going to be my Vanna. Okay. I asked him to wear sparkly items, but he refused. Good evening. Um, this front, front page is just introducing um, everyone to the uh, Board of Education, uh, the members, um, but we don't have to stay on that. Dr. Guadir, could you do me a favor? Can we just go to the very end slide? Not the CIP, but the Board Missions and Goals. I kind of want to start off there. So. Um, several years ago, the board on a retreat got together and our mission state statement is teaching and learning with the goals is to provide dynamic, rigorous curriculum, ensure effective and engaging instruction, and embrace excellent learning environments. And I did not know that I was one of the, the photographs, so I apologize about that. Can we go back to the beginning? So what, some of the things that um, the board would like to just highlight of the things that we have been able to accomplish this past year or um, continue to work on is that we have been able to maintain effective um, class sizes. And you'll see sort of a quick slide on that um, in, a, in two seconds. Um, that uh, what we were able to do um, is to restore the school site budgets um, in the, f the fiscal year of 18, um, to the fiscal, um, fiscal year of uh, 18 level. That we um, continue to enhance our li um, literacy work programs with writer workshops, reader workshops, um, and that we, through those programs, um, have been doing the classroom libraries, and that's through um, K through 12. So not only just having our media centers, but actually having our individual classrooms, having um, the libraries, um, the books that the um, children and um, teachers need to continue their learning. Um, we have also been able to implement um, that uh, uh, math workshops um, to kind of help our uh, rigor and our relevance. Uh, we are sharing currently uh, with the town council um, a school resource officer and that we have um, actually just been um, 
uh, given a uh, technology plan um, by our technology uh, department um, to upgrade in our aging classroom technology um, infrastructure. Um, and that we have also been able to retain all of our extracurricular activities. I'm sorry that I'm reading it off, but I think it's so important that you hear all the stuff that we're able to do within our budget. Um, that we are able to, um, one of the things that we approved last year was our APEX program, which is an online learning program um, for not only for uh, students who need the remedial or sort of, uh, is it credit recovery as well? Credit recovery, um, but also that any student um, in the high school level can do that for um, enrichment. Um, we support, we have two element, um, elementary magnet schools um, and that is our STEM, which is Catherine Konalski, and our Northeast Academy, which is our Arts and Humanities. Uh, we continue to have the one-to-one -one computer program, and that we have a phenomenal uh, 18 to 20 year old vocational program. Uh, and we uh, have, we're no longer piloting, is that correct, the national uh, science? And so we're being, yeah, so, yeah, so we are now um, being tested on our uh, uh, generation science standards, which is a, um, a mandate that happened from, that came through through the state. And uh, we also have um, thought long and hard about our enrichment programs, both for in school and after school, and that has been expanded to, uh, to the middle school. And uh, we also, for how many of our uh, schools do we have an after school program? Four. So we now we currently have four um, before and after school programs to help support um, children and families. Uh, not only not what's not on the highlights is that um, I'm sure many of you know that um, the Fitch uh, many members of the Fitch Middle School um, band and chorus um, got to got to uh, uh, go into the parade for the Queen's Parade in London, England. Um, high school, Fitch High School. Um, and also, we just found out last Monday that our robotics team um, did make it to the worlds, we believe. Um, and they will be going, they did. And they are going to be going to Detroit, Michigan to uh, uh, get that title. So we are very excited about them. Uh, what, what you have this slide um, is just to kind of present to us that um, really in for the seven past years, we have only had an increase of our budget by 0.65%. Um, um, and we just think that that's important where we have had to um, kind of uh, sustain 0% um, budgets um, and with increased salary. Um, actually, could you go to that pie slot? The one, so, when, when you think about the 0% increases that we've had in our budget, that we have lots of fixed costs in our budget and the salary and benefits, tuition, um, transportation, utilities, um, those are the ones that we can't, we, there's nothing that we can play with on that. So when we talk about having to find monies, we really are tapping into that discretionary needs and I think that that's important to think about. So when you look um, at a school budget, they are always, and I believe that this is throughout the land, is that there are eight categories when we think about um, a school budget. And it's the salaries, the benefits, purchase services, property services, transportation, um, communi communication tuition, and that would be special ed tuition, or tuition to the magnet schools, um, out of district, um, and supplies, equipment, and dues and fees. Um, and just uh, to help people out, the purchase services are our professional um, services that are, that are um, so basically it's services and personnel that is not um, funded or salaried by our district. So it's medical, it's our occupational therapist, our physical therapist, um, and other, um, uh, other special uh, testing that needs to be done um, to help uh, um, some of our students. So we, um, if you look um, at the bottom line, what you see is, is that we are asking for 1.24% increase um, in our total budget, going from 76 to 77 million. And um, our biggest things, um, when you look at percent increases, would be um, 
our equipment, which is the second from the um, bottom, and that is um, reflecting the uh, fiscal year 19 budget. We um, cut it when we received our cut. We um, took a lot from our equipment and that we, if you think about it, we have a $44,000 equipment budget for a $76 million budget. And so we just wanted to put it restorative um, to, and also make it um, whole and also make it realistic to what we need. And so that's where that 87% happens. But with all of them that we were able to do, um, actually our superintendent proposed a 2.6% and we were able to get it down to a 1.24. So um, do you wanna go one ahead? Yes. So when we take a look at the fiscal year or this current year's budget, um, this just kind of, um, states out the $29 million, the educational cost sharing, the um, other state funds, the federal impact aid, which I believe came in higher, okay, and um, the SPED access, uh, excuse me, the special ed education cost and the Medicaid um, and, and other sources, that that $29 million actually goes straight to the town. Um, and so when we take a look at the the budget, um, the, the fiscal year 19 budget, that's the whole of the town. And um, we kind of broke it down to that's the, that's the taxes that needed to be raised this current year. Um, and our Board of Education budget was 76, but you minus the 29 um, that the town receives from all those other things. And what, it hap what, what you then end up having is to understand that um, in the fiscal year for um, 2019, 53.8 percent, or 54 um, percent, of your of your taxes was going to fund the education. I think we did that. Okay. So as we mentioned, as one of the things that we have tried to always hold true is um, the board feels very strongly that there are class sizes that make the most educational sense, um, so that the teacher and the students can get the best um, out of our. Um, out of our, our money, um, and the board has um, put a standard of 20 um, in the younger grades, the kindergarten through third, um, and then our fourth through 20, uh, for the 20th. How about the grade four to grade 12? Um, we have about 25, and so if you look um, at our class size enrollments, uh, we have pretty much hit the mark through most of that. Um, some of our classes sizes do change in the high school um, depending on sort of if it's a special education class um, or we have some AP classes or some IB classes that have a lower enrollment. Um, I think actually John, um, or excuse me, the town manager uh, touched upon that, but when you take a look at um, the, what we got the most recent um, was the 2017-2018, um, we are actually lo lower by 780 um, that uh, $780, but when you times that by 5,000, which is what we're averaging about what our class enrollment or our pupil enrollment is, that that is about $3.5 million um, that we are not having if we did the class um, Connecticut average of 16.9. So um, we, our budget, um, there are what we would consider two types of grants. There's a categorical, categorical grants and there's the competitive grants. And the categorical grants are the ones that are up there, up on top. Um, your Title I through your Title IV grants. Um, and what was nice is that we did kind of give you a little bit of explanation about what those grants are. Um, and for the fiscal year 19, um, three million and so um, came, came to us or came to the town to us, correct? Yes. To us, um, uh, at the $3 million rate. Um, the competitive grants, um, we have been incredibly successful. We have a phenomenal team um, uh, led by Sharon Weigel, who uh, is our, uh, does grant writing for us. And we have been able to receive, through multiple years, um, 
um, some incredible grants um, that has helped really added, um, enriched our, um, our educational process. I do have to say that our elementary teachers um, have had lots of, lots of the new grants um, and they have worked incredibly hard to incorporate um, these, these grants um, into, into their own professional knowledge um, to then be, give it, be able to give it to um, the students. Um, and I think s for those of you who have heard my spiel, um, it, a lot of that is the, the Writers College um, and the Readers Workshop and the, our math. Um, the DODIA is our um, de Department of Defense Educational activity. There's so many acron acronyms, but those but those are the last three um, that we have been able to get. And one of the things um, that people often question us about is that's really nice that you get this grant for five years, but how are you going to sustain it? Um, and I just want to let you know that we have um, we embed our professional um, training because um, a lot of the grants, the the train the to sustainability is really to make sure that people are. Um, uh, gain the skills to be able to do that and that we have um, in many instances like a train the trainer model where we have teachers who that have learned this and so that they can then um, move that forward so the competitive grants are not just something that's that hangs out for for five years that it's that it's part of our sustainability plan um, and right now we're our, our big one is the magnet school assistance program that w that um, that enabled us to um, start the two middle school magnet programs where at um, West Side Middle School we have the STEM program and at Cutler we have the arts and humanity um, and um, those two once we get the that build that beautiful building on the hill built um, is that those two um, will be um, place right into the middle school program. Oh, so that is that is sort of what we have, um, and um, we, as uh, uh, our town manager um, stated, was that um, in February 28th was when the board was able to um, vote on the budget, um, but we had been working on it probably all month of January and February. Um, to get the budget um, ready for you guys. So, thank you. Thank you, Chairperson Watson. Okay. We are on to item six on the agenda, which is the opening of the public hearing. At this time, when you are recognized, please come to the podium and state your name and address for the record and speak into the microphone so that it can be captured for the people watching at home and for the video. Each presentation should be limited to five minutes or less and citizens should, if possible, submit written comments. I'll do my best with pronunciations. I apologize if I get anybody's name pronounced incorrectly. So we have Lemmy Yalson followed by Sue Aberbach. Let me Elchin. I am here to tell you why I like the library. When I go to the library, I feel like I'm in this room filled with doors and doors of, well, you know what. And when you open the door, it's a book. And when, and when you go in the doors, it's really exciting. And another, and another thing, when I go to a library, I feel like I'm surrounded with inspiration. Thank you for, thank you for listening. Good night. Thank you. Sue Aberbach. Good evening, my name is Sue Aberbeck. I live at 19 Totog Street. I am a volunteer and the president of the Groton Public Library Circle of Friends. As a volunteer, I've had the opportunity to spend longer periods of time than when I was just a library patron or user. And when I've been at the library for a few hours, I've been amazed at the number of people from our community who come to take advantage of the many resources and services available to us all. 
I encourage you too to spend some time at Groton Public Library to observe and participate in programs like author lectures, free movies, concerts live from Lincoln Center, festivals and fairs about local history, a holly, holiday artisan fair, edible books, a summer camp job fair, workshops and free resources like Ancestry.com to research your own family history, the expertise of the library staff for technical advice, even from our own volunteer corps of teen tech advisors. The library staff who are available to you to apply for a U.S. passport. The library's dedication to its mission of community literacy extends beyond its walls. Staff and volunteers deliver books and media to homebound residents, nursery schools, and little free libraries in places like Esker Point Beach, housing developments, and local coffee shops. Groton Municipal Television shows are filmed by library staff and broadcast across our town, sharing important civic meetings and events. I hope you soon have an opportunity to spend time at Groton Public Library to see for yourself the valuable resources it offers to all of our citizens. I thank you for your support in the past and into the future. For your reference, I will distribute a year in review that details and quantifies the impressive accomplishments of Groton Public Library in this past year. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Charles Stevens followed by Wes Johnson. <clears throat> Chuck Stevens, 12 Stony Hill Drive. Uh, I'd like to just take a few minutes and direct your attention to a capital improvement program uh, proposal. It's on page 225 of your budget book. The council at some point in the past decided to uh, use the Fitch Middle School and convert it, make the investment to convert it to a community center, which has been tremendously successful. There is a capital improvement proposal to make a good building better, which is uh, to change the lighting to an LED system. And this has the advantage of uh, not only providing a better facility, but also uh, putting into place cost savings. This is a $58,000 project to convert the entire building to LED lighting. There is a conservation incentive which will drop that cost to $42,000 to the town. There may be some grants available. Uh, the Recreation Department will be looking at that. But it will produce a yearly savings, a yearly energy savings of $13,000. So this is a program that will basically uh, pay for itself within 3.2 years and after that the cost savings will be passed on to the, to the town and the, the project will be paid for. Uh, this is going to take uh, a, good, a good building and make it better. Uh, this is a very worthwhile capital improvement plan and I hope that you'll be able to continue to support it in the budget. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Stevens. Wes Johnson followed by Kathy Nugent. Hi, my name is Wes Johnson, uh, 7 Mystic Avenue, Noack. Um, I too am here to speak about the same project that Mr. Stevens was speaking. Um, it is a capital improvement project and I'm here to talk about the investment not only in a financial way, which I think that Chuck did a very nice job of articulating, but it also into the community reach. And I think this investment really goes beyond what most folks may realize. With the, um, now I personally uh, play pickleball over there with a group of folks uh, in the gym and we sort of first identified the issue that the lighting there was a bit substandard. We started to look into the cost of putting LED into just the gym. As we brought this forward to the recreation department, they helped us understand that this truly was a broader reach. For the pickleball folks, we have about 50 people who come over and play weekly, but over the course of the year, it has involved more than 200 individuals who have come to play there. But we're just a microcosm of what's happening there at the Groton Community Center. Today, there are over 300 participants who walk in those doors every day to participate in programs. If you extrapolate in the same way that the pickleball numbers extrapolated, 
that really comes down to, well, actually, it's more than a 1,000 different people a week. But if you extrapolate like we did with the pickleball and we looked at the total number of participants, you're looking at over 2,000 different folks that come there and use that facility. And this program is, I mean, this facility is really just in the infancy of its youth, of its use. So in summation, really what I'd like to say is that when you recognize that this capital investment in, in the long run will end up delivering cost savings to the operating budget and in addition impact about 5% of the population of Groton, I think it's a worthwhile effort. Thank you for your consideration. Thank you, Mr. Johnson. Kathy Nugent, followed by Tom Tessak. Good evening. Can you hear me? Yes. I'm Kathy Nugent, 215 Yetta Road, Mystic, Connecticut. I'm here to talk about the North, North Stonington Road Bridge CIP. Counselors, I urge you to restore funding to finish this project, which for eight plus years has been the subject of much discussion, debate, fits and starts, and now appears slated to be abandoned. So pardon me if I have a sense of deja vu to be once again here talking to you. First, I'd like to address the issue of public safety, and I uh, direct you to the Google map that I left in your places. Sorry if what it looks like. Um, the orange, okay, so here's the old Mystic Station 1 at the top of North Stonington Road. Before the bridge went, uh, was closed, due to, don't know the background, <coughs> 2010, this major storm, you see there was a direct straight line from the fire department down to Route 27 or Shoe Wheel Road, from which you could go up to 184 to service these areas here. Now, <clears throat> since, and, and avoiding all this commercial area. Since the bridge is closed, now it has to go down Main Street, Old Mystic, to this three-way intersection and a hard right up 27. Not only is this route longer, but this is a very busy three-way intersection in the center of Old Mystic. Uh, by the Mystic General Store, Old Mystic Post Office, there's an antique shop, church, B&B, &B, uh, all with cars merging in and out of traffic. It's challenging, I go that route a lot, it's challenging for a car. Imagine what it must be like to try to navigate a fire department emergency vehicle through the intersection and you pray there are no illegally parked vehicles or parked delivery trucks. Now this isn't a once in a while call. Uh, the last information we had from Chief Richards, and I think you got his email too, was in 2016 there were 500 such calls. This has led to delays in response times to, to, to emergencies, creating a major public safety problem. This is a disaster waiting to happen. The minimum requirement of government is to ensure public safety. When I was on the RTM at a meeting, I raised the question, this was be before your time, Mr. Burke, as if the town would have any liability if there was such a disaster and delayed response time could be partially responsible. Nobody seemed to know. I never got an answer. I suggest you get an answer. Don't take my word for it. Take a drive down and see for yourself. The second issue is how we pay for it. Right now, we have a straight state grant for almost $600,000 and an agreement, or we had an agreement, with the town of Stonington to su split the remaining 600000 So as I understand it, the plan now is to leave $900,000 over on the table here uh, in order to here save $300,000 and not fix the problem. In my mind, that's fuzzy math. Um, now, I know we're all excited about the 0% budget increase, so I'm not proposing you... You have one minute. ...not proposing you increase the budget, but I am requesting that you look for savings elsewhere and make this bridge a priority. And the, I mentioned that we have a 50-50 agreement with Stonington to pick up the remaining costs. Are we just going to walk away from our agreement with our neighbor town? That bodes ill, that bodes Ill for fu future projects we may want to do with Stonington and other area towns if we can't be depended on to keep our word. In conclusion, like that old Nike commercial, let's just get this done. Let's restore the funding 
and get this project over the finish line. Thank you. Thank you. Tom Tessak, followed by Dante Laferino. Hello, my name is Tom Tesiak. I am eight years old. I like the library because it has a lot of good books and new ones a lot. I like to go to the library every week. I really like the coding class. It made me code a lot better. I take an art class at the library. I see my friends at the library. The library needs all the money that it has. It would be good if the library had even more money so that I could get bigger to have more books and classes. I get a lot of books at the library and it makes reading exciting. Thank you. Dante Laparino followed by Franco Laparino. Hi, I'm Dante. I'm seven years old. I like, I love the library because of the homeschool art smart, the awesome books, other classes, and I can't wait to see what new books they'll bring. Thank you. Franco Laparino followed by Marcel Dufresne. Okay, should we go on to Marcel? Marcel Dufresne, followed by Gary Wells, please. Marcel Dufresne, 6 North Stonington Road. Um, and I love the library too, but I'm not here to talk about that tonight, I'm sorry. Um, my house is the last house in the northeast corner of uh, Groton, and I, my property abuts the North Stonington Bridge, which has been out as of this month for nine months, excuse me, nine years. I appreciate that Kathy gave you kind of the macro situation with that bridge, but I'm gonna provide a, a, a micro viewpoint of what it's like on our street. There are really, from Shoeville Road, you, you all have the maps. From Shoeville Road to the bridge itself, there are four houses there. Uh, we have all, I'm gonna basically make four points, running from aesthetics to fire safety and traffic safety. Um, one of the things that, that I heard, I only really realized I was gonna to speak today, so I don't have a more formal presentation, but the, um, the, the main issues have tended to be uh, about cars coming down that stretch of road who are guided by their GPSs, uh, large, oftentimes taking a shortcut through Old Mystic, headed for the cider mill. Uh, they all reach a dead end. Easily, on a summer day or fall day, we can get 20 to 25 cars uh, that have to, this is a road that's not even two car widths wide. Uh, runs probably 200 feet, maybe 300, and we get all manner of campers. We get tractor trailers who take a wrong turn, who have nowhere to go. Most of the cars turn in my driveway, but the rest of them have to be escorted, driving backwards, delivery trucks, back the length of the road until they can find a way to navigate and to get, get out of our neighborhood. Um, one of the things I heard is that we have not, the, the town hasn't heard a lot of complaints about it. And frankly, uh, the reason being the neighbors, myself and, and my neighbors, have all put our faith in the town that they would resolve this. I can tell you, if you need complaints, we're more than happy to provide them in a more you know, cohesive rationale for this. But I can tell you, um, just in the past six months, uh, my neighbor, uh, Trish LaPointe, who is also here, We've both had encounters with vehicles who were not paying attention. We've, had, we've both had uh, accidents uh, with cars. And in fact, back in November, um, I'm sorry, in August of last year, I sent a letter to the Public Works Department about how the signs that were inadequate to tell people that this road is closed. And the Public Works came out, they put up new signs. It hasn't helped. We still get people who just follow the GPS right to the end of the road and they basically stop. So we've had a couple of accidents there. The second point, which is really more pressing, and I've only really come to realize how dangerous it is for the houses on that street, is we don't have a fire hydrant anywhere near our property. 
Uh, there used to be one, right, there is one right at the, near the firehouse, and they could run a line down our, across the bridge to our houses. But right now, the only, the nearest fire hydrant, which was pointed out to me by Ken Richards, the fire chief, is across the street from the, the, uh, the general store in the post office. That means to run a hose, they would have to go around the corner, down along 27, take a bend at Shoeville Road, take another corner with the hose, and, and it's approximately a quarter mile from that hydrant to my house, which is the last house on the route. So there's a genuine fire danger for any of our properties there by not having access to water and quick access to our homes by the fire department. You have um, one minute, sir. I'm sorry? You have one minute? One minute? Okay, I'll wrap it up. Um, I, I do invite people to come down and be glad to show you what it looks like and what the issues are. Um, aesthetically, that bridge is a nightmare. It's, it's hideous. Uh, there's no decking. It's all kind of like stockade fencing around it now. There's a Jersey barrier at the end of my property. I'm not one to complain about property values, but I have to say this is distinctly an eyesore the way it is. And it may actually be, for enterprising kids, I'm sure they could jump over the wall, the fence, and, and get into the, where there's no decking, you would go right into the, into the, uh, into the brook. So uh, aside from the, uh, the eyesore and the safety issues, I do think we'd like to know what the plan is if there is no plan, at minimum, to clean the area up and make it safe. And also address our, our fire issues because we, we're coming to realize that's a real distinct uh, hazard for us on that street. Thank you for your time. Oh, and again, if anyone would like to, uh, I have copies of the letter that I explained the accidents to, to the public works people. I'm, I'm glad to leave copies here. And I'm more than willing to uh, show anyone around and uh, explain um, some of the details that I just elaborated on. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Dufresne. If you'd like to leave a copy of the letter with the clerk, she can then um, distribute it to us via email. Thank you. Gary Wells, followed by Sandy Scott. I'm, I'm Gary Wells. I'm RTM representative for District 5. I live in Old Mystic at 5 Route 27, Mystic. Uh, I'm going to follow up on everyone in town knows the bridge is an eyesore. That's, that's pretty obvious. I'd recommend, uh, you know, anyone want to take a look at it, go to the, take a look at it from the Stonington side. <laughs> You'll be able to get out of your car and take a look at it. Going in the Groton side, you're going to have to turn around in Marcel's driveway to get out of there. Uh, as an elected official or a representative, you know, that it's an eyesore and everybody says, when are they going to fix this? Uh, I have to look a little more closely and ask more questions. And I did talk, to, I stopped at the uh, fire district and they keep a short truck there because of the difficulties of navigating around Old Mystic. Old Mystic is an old town. You've seen the signs, welcome to Mystic, settle 1654. They could turn those towns around, signs around. The, the oldest house in town is an Old Mystic. Most of the, uh, the, many of the buildings that you find at the Mystic Seaport used to be an Old Mystic and they brought them down to Mystic. Uh, it's always been a crossroads. There's traffic through there. John Mason came through on the Indian Trail to uh, attack the fort at uh, Mystic. And subsequent to that, King Charles uh, built the post road through there. We still use that road. And the, uh, the newest road in town is the North Stonington Road. It was built in 1818 as part of the Groton Stonington Turnpike which subsequently became the New London to Providence Turnpike, most likely the first interstate turnpike in the country. It was bypassed by Route 184 in the 1930s, and now, I guess most of you know, uh, bypassed by Interstate 95. When there's an accident on Interstate 95, it blocks the highway. It's not unusual for the entire northbound or the southbound, depending on where the accident, to go back up through Old Mystic on the post road, thank you, King Charles, and get, get around this. The, um, they built the bridge. The turnpike was built with private funds. The road that they're currently using down through by the general store with a three-way stop, that was available in 1818. 
they spent private money to build that road, build that bridge, so they didn't have to drag a coach around and around that store. It wasn't adequate for stagecoaches in 1818. It's not really adequate for fire trucks now. Old Mystic keeps a short fire truck because of the difficulty of getting around Old Mystic. There's, I think you've already mentioned the right turn from Main Street up on there. Often they have to wait for cars to come forward, try to signal cars to come through to get them off the bridge so they can go by. If the same thing happens, I found out on Shoeville Road that uh, there's not really enough room to pass. And so they have to wait for the cars to come down Shoeville Road before they can go up Shoeville Road. I used to think they'd just duck up Lantern Hill Road. The road's steep. If you look at it, you'll see it's all dug up. They have to cross that road at a 45 degree angle, which also means cars coming the other way. Stonington is working hard at building, uh, is, uh, working with the state and planning to put uh, sidewalks and bike paths to make, uh, make it easy for pedestrians and cyclists to go from their new uh, boathouse park near the seaport up to Old Mystic and we would assume down the river road, which is extremely popular. And I, I've got, heard complaints, and uh, well, I'm aware of them, that cyclists coming up the river road and continuing up into the country would normally use the North Stonington Road rather than, than navigate through a three-way intersection in the summertime. This is, um, we have a streetscape, Streetscape uh, 3 coming up, and I see one of the plans is to narrow Allen Street. I assume that's to, so that uh, the state won't force us to raid the speed limit to the same as, as it is on the Stonington side. You have one minute. I think I'll quit at one minute. Okay. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Wilson. Sandy Scott followed by John Watson. Sandy Scott, 191 Pequot Avenue. My husband and I are here today to support the Mystic and Noank Library, which is an integral part of the life of the eastern part of the town of Groton. It is heavily used by both children and adults, as seen by the wide range of ages of patrons making use of the books, ebooks, and computers for both personal, business, and research purposes. There are many programs available to the public during the year, including those of historical, musical, and literary subjects, and the Ames Room hosts a variety of art shows on a monthly rotating basis. The story times in the children's activity room serve about 180 preschool children during the school year and 120 during the summer months. There are several book, book clubs for adults as well. It has been and continues to be an important resource for this part of town. Many people walk to the library, which speaks to its convenience to this densely populated area. The Mystic and Noack Library has been in continuous service since 1893 and deserves the support of the town through its budget. For the last two fiscal years, we have had our funding cut drastically. Fiscal year ending 2017, we were awarded $183,394. Fiscal year ending 2018, $122,291, a 33% cut. Fiscal year 2019, $100,000, an 18.5% cut. Now the proposal this year is for $75,000, which is a 25% cut. We realize that there is a need to lessen the tax burden, but a community cannot have too many literary and cultural resources to benefit its population. Please do not decrease the amount of the budget for this important resource. Thank you for your consideration. Thank you, Ms. Scott. John Watson, followed by Catherine Brighty. Good evening, and thank you. I'm John Watson, residing at 215 Elm Street with my wife and family. Uh, we've been residents, property owners, parents, and volunteers in the town of Groton, as well as taxpayers for 40 plus years. Um, two kids educated in Groton, thank you very much. Help me remember to come back to that if I have time at the end. Um, great job on the budget. I found it insightful, detailed, and realistic. Um, as a recent retiree, I uh, really do appreciate the zero mill rate um, increase and also achieving the 15% fund balance. I understand the importance of that. But we also have interests that we would like to see promoted as well as parks, recreation, senior center, libraries, and more. As I was going through the budget, reading it, and I've read almost all of it, um, it occurred to me that this needs to be more than just a session to appeal to you to promote my favorite activities or cut something else that I might not care as much. So I'm here to give you a pep talk, if that's okay. Um, I really appreciated 
The town manager's comments on page 10 of his budget, which said, in dealing with changing budget revenue realities, we need to make certain that we do not damage our long-term prospect for growth and strong financial management practices in order to achieve short-term tax relief. Amen. Great comment. So on that basis, I'd encourage all parties, town employees, counselors, businesses, residents, and others to more aggressively partner together to promote Groton as the great place that it is to live in, to work, to conduct business, and to retire. It's a whole equation. It goes from end to end. The concept is, let's use the best of what we've got to attract and retain residents and businesses and take those resources even further as part of a publicly supported strategy. And there are many words of, that lead me to be encouraged that that's going to happen uh, under our current leadership, and I think that's great. Um, the basic approach is identify key employment needs and opportunities, as an example. I understand EB is looking for 3,000 or 4,000 workers, okay? It's not me, it's not us who are over 60 and retired, or, you know, so what can we do to help them do that? Get into the details, don't just generalize, don't just have nice sit down discussions about what we could do, go out and do it. And enlist volunteers if you need to, there are plenty of us around. Look at the ages, needs, interests, understand the must haves and the delighters in that demographic. What do they want, what do they need, what can we offer them? Show them what we can already do to meet those expectations and also show them how we are working to go even further as part of our town strategy. So if one of them comes into town because they see all these wonderful things that we offered them and uh, Jerry Loken over at Parks and Rec said, what, what if they got here and they said, hey, this is almost as good as my college campus. That's the kind of thinking I'd love to help promote. What might this look like? EB needs 3,000 new employees. What are their ages and interests? How many of them can we attract? Help EB market our great resources such as locations, recreation, not only the town, but state and private resources as well. Put them into one package. EB doesn't need six packages telling them how good it is. They need one package telling them, this is what we can show to the kid in college in Indiana who we want to hire to bring here, or even better, the Fitch graduate that we would like to get to stay here. That's what I had to get back to. Um, there are a couple of things in the plan that look really great. Uh, golf. I love the forward-looking statement in Shenacosset's plan, and I'm going to read from that on page 161. Goals for next year. Increase membership and in play among 21 to 35-year-olds. Bingo. Expand marketing efforts focused on millennials, including development of YouTube pages. Bingo again. Not the conventional modalities of communication that I would use. YouTube, Facebook, whatever else. Conduct focus group to understand how to better use it. The list goes on. You have one minute, sir. Thank you very much. Um, we've got a great interconnected trail system. That's great for biking and hiking. We've got great water access, which is great for kayaking, sailing, and so forth. You get the slant towards Parks and Rec. I'm sorry, I can't help it. Volleyball at Esker Point. Soccer year-round. I know soccer may not be on all your charts, but any Sunday afternoon you go out to Aquatic Plains or in the winter up to Fitch High School, you'll see anywhere between 15 and 50 people, my age on down to 16, representing four to five continents, ancestrally anyway, playing soccer. What a great intergenerational mixer. That's great. Um, and extend this into the future. I love Mr. Johnson's example with the lighting at the current community center. You start at 58,000 bucks for lights and all of a sudden you're up to impacting favorably, hopefully 2,000 people in our town or more. And that's the type of thing I want to get us building along on that strategic vision, which is what might that community center look like in the future? As an example of how that works is, we're standing in a senior center that started as a concept. Um, getting back to education. Your time we is up, invested sir. in an honor system that got one of my kids a full semester's worth of tuition, and that had great value to me. So thank you very much. Thank you. Catherine Brighty and then Anne Marie, and I'm sorry, I can't read the last name, but it's Anne Marie from Orchard Lane, please. Let me just say, I thought the last speaker was very inspiring. I moved here in the mid 80s, and I'm going to be here till I draw, draw my last breath. <laughs> um, my name is Catherine Brighty, and I live at 68 Brookshaven Road. I serve on the board of the Groton Public Library, and I'm here to ask for your support. Our vibrant library serves Groton patrons starting at an early age. In the attractive children's area, library staff members offer innumerable activities for kids story time, crafts, music even a regular gathering for the under two crowd. One Saturday afternoon, I looked up and thought, 
heaven help us, someone's brought a very polite bear to the library. Turned out to be Phantom, a magnificent therapy dog who visits once a month to engage kids in reading. For young adults, the, teenage, the Teenscape suite houses books and videos, dedicated computers, and interaction spaces. Special programs for teens include a range of activities specifically for homeschooled students. These days, you don't even need to leave your house to access the library's many downloadable books, audiobooks, and magazines. Most people, however, and there are a huge number of them, visit our terrific library in person. When I've arrived before 9 a.m., there's been a group of residents already waiting to come in. Just in February, 14,000 people came through the door and borrowed nearly 16,000 books. The public computers were used over 4,000 times, and 1,300 people attended one of the 67 programs hosted or presented by the library. The Groton Public Library preserves our history. I'm sure you're all aware of the recent expansion of the local history room as a result of Jim Streeter's generous donation of his collection. I was charmed to discover microfilm archives of the New London Day newspaper in the computer area from 1937 to today. There are even somehow more than a decade of day archives from the late 1800s. Groton Municipal Television, as you know, is based at the library. In addition to allowing our citizens to see town meetings such as this one, the GMTV YouTube website has a rich collection of Groton and Connecticut history, with programs on Connecticut's submarine century and videos from presentations on topics such as Fort Griswold, the Avery Cop House, and the Hurricane of 38. And it's not all about the past. The library is also deeply committed to helping patrons prepare for the future. There are multiple technology courses every month, from smartphone literacy to developing skills with Microsoft Excel. Both teens and adults receive career guidance on resume writing, cover letters, interview skills. Even small children have access to digital experience via tiny desks equipped with early learning computers. And of course, the library provides a vast and diverse collection of books, audio, and video that intrigue and expand our minds with new ideas. I'd be hard pressed to house, or even afford, the number of books I'm exposed to each year through our wonderful library. The Groton Public Library represents an investment in our future. I urge you to continue your support for this critical town function. Thank you for the opportunity to speak and for all your work on behalf of the town. Thank you. Anne-Marie, followed by W.T.S. Butler, please. Hi, I'm Anne-Marie de Graff and Wright. Thank you. I'm at 3 Orchard Lane. Um, I'm here to talk about living at the low end of my street. Um, that's something that wasn't put in the butter budget, it was proposed, and it's to correct the flooding that occurs on Orchard Lane every time there's a serious downpour. Um, at the bottom, in front of my house, there are two catch basins that are joined by a French drain, which basically is a tube that lets the water seep into the underground and into the soil around in, in the street. When that French drain is over capacity, it floods. It backs up my driveway, down my side yard, down the um, stairs to my side yard and it basically is flooding. This got worse when they did the bump out on Route 1. Um, there was a proposal to correct this, which was made by the Public Works Department, which was taken out of the budget, and I'm asking that it be placed back in the budget. Uh, it doesn't only impact me at the low point, it impacts everyone who drives through the street. And fortunately or unfortunately, people make the drive through my street to avoid the light at the top of Allen Street. So it, it happens frequently when there's, when there's flooding, which is every time there's a serious rain, um, it backs up and it will last, it lasts a long time. So I'm here just to ask that that, um, it's approximately $50,000 be put back into the budget to make that correction to the street. Thank you. Thank you. WTS Butler followed by Roseanne Katowski, please. My name is Sherman Butler. I live at 6 uh, Pearl in Noank. Um, I'm a federal labor arbitrator and a former school arbitrator. And uh, the librarians at the two libraries I happen to use, who are well aware of the pests that I can be, asked me to come and explain the value of these libraries um, 
to whoever would like to listen. I've lived in nine significant towns in Connecticut, and I'm a library hoarder. I go there, I use them to the death. I can say in all honesty that the Groton Public Library system, including that building there, Mystic Noank, and Bill, are among the finest in this state, and it's because you've put the resources in there. Um, I have sat where you sit, so you don't need to have me suggest what you might or might not do regarding their budgets. But I thought I might offer a simple thought about where I, as a uh, neutral arbitrator, have seen arm's length value in your wonderful institutions. First of all, respectfully, I would ask you to kindly think of uh, Mystic Noank Library, not as an outside agency, because it isn't. The Groton Public Library and its collection are not that building you see across the parking lot. They are the collection of Bill, Groton Public, uh, Mystic Noank, and I, I think Ledger also and, and Waterford are included in that. But the point is, the library is the collection and those hardworking professionals who allow people like me to have access to them. If you think about those libraries in Toto with regards to your budget, you might uh, have a thought about possibly making sure that uh, there's a reasonable, even-handed distribution of resources to support them. Um, a thought about Mystic Noank Library. I use Groton as much as I use Mystic Noank for different reasons but I use them both and almost daily. Quite a few of the federal labor arbitration awards I've written as well as a few school interest uh, arbitrations have been written right there using your libraries, your printers, your librarians helping me to uh, work with the uh, software programs which I'm not particularly skilled at. So I can tell you that you're really getting your money's worth from the staff and the collections and the facilities that you've provided there. I'm really grateful to that. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Butler. Roseanne Katowski, followed by Roger Richards. Good evening. Roseanne Katowski, 24 Ann Avenue, RTM District 5. First, I appreciate that the taxpayers are getting a break in the 2020 budget with a zero tax increase. Thank you. After a 20.07 tax increase for the pa in the past four years, it is well deserved. The questions and comments that I have regarding the 2020 budget will hopefully be addressed during the town council budget meetings. <clears throat> As we heard tonight, the 2020 budget is increasing $3.5 million and the town is using $1.5 million of fund balance. It will be interesting to hear how the town manager and town council use how this use of fund balance will affect the 2020 budget considering 3.5 million as well as the school debt service will already be baked into the 2021 budget also there is a total of 3.5 new employees in the 2020 budget during what i thought was a hiring freeze hopefully we will be convinced in the coming weeks that this is money wisely spent on page three, it states that wage increases for the town's unions and non-unions have been built into the budget. Hopefully that means there will be no requests for transfers from contingency for raises. It appears in the 2020 budget that all town employees are receiving over 3% in raises. It is my understanding that this is due to a new high deductible insurance plan. The question is, why the high raises, considering that the taxpayers are paying for half of the employees' deductibles? The planning department, of course, is getting more. In the budget, the top three planning salaries were adjusted up $10,088 in 2019. Since this expenditure is over $10,000, why didn't that adjustment come to the RTM? In addition to the $10,088 increase, these same three positions are scheduled for $20,106 in raises for 2020. This is excessive and hopefully the town council and RTM will not support it. Regarding the water pollution control facility user fees increase, it is important for the town council to research the WPCF user fee increases over the past 10 years and determine if this is reasonable. 
Regarding the Board of Education budget, I would like the Town Council to consider funding the Board of Ed at minimum budget requirement. On page 11, the Town Manager explains that when the Alliance District ends, the Town will lose $4.7 million. Before we raise the MBR this year, it is important to know what the plan is to protect the taxpayers if the town is required to add $4.7 million to the MBR in 2022 when the Alliance District designation ends. The Town Council and the RTM should support the town manager's proposed decreases in outside agencies, keeping in mind that the underlying reason for the decreases is duplication and triplication of services and to end the practice of sending money out of Groton. At the end of his message, the town manager discusses the fact that the town will eventually have to make decisions regarding spending versus taxes. It is my hope that the dis decisions regarding spending versus taxes will be included in the town council 2020 budget discussions and are not put off to another budget year. Again, thank you for protecting the taxpayers from another tax increase for 2020. Thank you. Uh, Roger Richards, followed by Jamie Densmore. I'm Dr. Roger Richards, live at 169 Pear Lane. Uh, there are a couple of items on the budget that uh, were categorized as outdoor, outside agencies rather than inside. And you've already heard some speakers uh, point out that these really should not be thought of as simply outsiders. They're a principal part of the community. Uh, ambulance service for one. Uh, we've got two ambulance services here in most municipalities. That service is supplied by the town, paid for by the taxpayers. What I want to focus you on is uh, these are nonprofit organizations. Nonprofits uh, have a reputation for being rather fragile. If something would happen to one of these, you would have to replace it. And if you try and replace it inside the town, inside the town's budget, it is going to cost you a great deal more than what those services are costing you right now. Uh, they have a good donor base, a good support in the community. Donors don't tend to follow things that go into government. People don't donate a whole lot to governments, local or national. They expect that to be paid for by the taxpayers. Libraries are the same. You have one very good municipal library and you've got two uh, other libraries in town. Uh, Mystic and Noank uh, was on one state list uh, a year ago, rated as the third best library in the state, right behind Beinecke at Yale as one. Uh, a lot of people would argue with that, but it's got to be a pretty good library to get on a list like that, even uh, if you're going to argue that it should have been fifth or sixth. Uh, it's a valuable asset to the community. Uh, you're looking at 3,000 people coming in. You want to attract them to stay here. You want to keep the character of the town good. Uh, costs. Uh, I'm a scientist. Everybody tells me don't talk about numbers. Uh, that's the only language I understand, sorry. But this is a budget meeting. Numbers are what you're supposed to be looking at. Uh, I know a little bit more about the numbers for the Mystic Noank Library. Uh, they put a door counter in last year, and the door counter says that that library gets over 100,000 people walking through the door every year. Uh, as it so happens, last year you coincidentally uh, gave support to that library of $100,000. Well, even I can do that math. It cost you a dollar a person through the, uh, through the gates. Uh, put that in perspective, the State Library of Connecticut 
does surveys every year. There's 178 libraries in Connecticut that report back. And the average cost of a patron walking through the door for the state is $10. You know, if something happened to that library, I think uh, th that's a pretty dramatic uh, return on investment. Uh, I think it's more complicated than that. Um, if that library were to close, I don't think all 100,000 are going to end up over here at uh, the municipal library. But a good minute, number sir. of them will, and they will have to have extra funds to keep up with the demand for those services. Right now, you're paying very little if anything happens and uh, the Groton Public Library has to take over. It's going to cost you a lot. What you've got are some very, very good investments. Uh, and you may see an awful lot of people championing libraries. Uh, if you look at uh, national statistics, the Library Associ National Library Association, ALA, says that half the residents of the United States are carrying library cards. And if you look at state statistics and local, that comes right down to here. So 50%, more than 50% of the voters in this town have library cards. If you look at the demographics, uh, that's more people than have students in your school. That's just to give you an idea of how important libraries are to this and almost every other community around. Don't skimp on them. Thank you. Jamie Densmore followed by Joanna Case. Hi, I'm Jamie Densmore, 78 Front Street in Noank. I'm also a graduate of Fitch, and I went to UConn at Avery Point, so I've been around this area for quite a while. I'm here tonight in support of the Mystic and Noank Library. When I was a child, I remember my mom taking me to the Mystic and Noank Library. It was a place that I always enjoyed going, where you could see your friends, be part of one of the children's programs, or just relax and read a book. When I was an undergrad, I commuted to UConn, and the library became a place where I could study and just chill out and escape from reality. After college, I moved away and just came back a few years ago. Upon returning to this area, I knew I wanted to become more active in some local organizations. And of course, my first thought was the Mystic and Noank Library. I began volunteering for events, and in this past year, I joined the board. For me, the Mystic and Noank Library has always been an extension of home. Could I have gone to other libraries in this town? Yes. But I feel the atmosphere and the community surrounding this library is special, and it is a place where I hope to bring my kids one day. Thus, I urge you to support the Mystic and Noank Library by approving the library director's budget, making it so that children now, like the young man we saw earlier, can grow up with experiences like I did and one day bring their children to the Mystic and Noank Library. Thank you. Thank you. Joanna Case, followed by Kathy Chase. My name is Joanna Case, and I live at 200 Cliff Street in Mystic. I'm here speaking in favor of supporting the budget for the Mystic and Noank Library this year and continuing your support in the future. I was director of the Mystic and Noank Library for 35 years, from 1972 to 2007, and I can assure you that we need your support. We do numerous fundraising events every year, both the Friends and the Board. We do um, grants for special equipment or special programming. We actively solicit donations and bequests. But when we sit down each year to prepare the budget, there is always a gap between what we can generate and what we need to operate. We're essentially a main branch for the Groton Public Library. We signed papers of, confederation, of federation with them in the 1970s, and we joined their circulation system in the 1980s, making all of our resources available through their online service. We supplement their services. We have similar programs, workshops, activities, um, computer classes, and we focus on our side of, of the town. 
but we also have a lot of users from the rest of the town that like a s older, smaller institution. I urge you to, to support the Mystic and Owen Library, and I thank you. Thank you. Kathy Chase, followed by Art Miller. Kathy Chase, 146 Indian Field Road, and I am on the RTM representing District 1. People are passionate about this service or that service or certain departments in the town. However, we cannot keep the status quo year in and year out just because it's always been there. With the uncertainty of state cuts and the state possibly passing costs to the town that they had paid for previously, we need to start making some changes. Mr. Burt's presentation was very clear on these uncertainties. I appreciate the decreases the town manager has made so far for the 2020 budget. In my view, these decreases are not enough. I know the fund balance is quite healthy right now, but what will happen in the future? With your personal finances, if you have a job that has a base salary and you also receive a bonus and you build your personal budget on the base and the bonus, what happens to your budget when the bonus disappears? This is what could happen with using money from the fund balance to have a 0% increase in the 2020 budget when in actuality there is an increase. We have to live within our means. Groton has some big expenses coming in 2020, not to mention future CIPs in order to maintain our town. Let's not let the money in the fund balance burn a hole in our pockets and hold on to it when there is a real need to use it. To sum this all up, both the town budget and the Board of Ed budget needs to be looked at very carefully to bring the town budget down to a true 0% increase and the Board of Education at MBR. This should be the goal. Thank you. Thank you, Art Miller, followed by Sarah Lathrop. <laughs> I'm Art Miller, and I live at 31 Stanton Lane. And if there's one thing tonight that's been impressive is hearing the individuals speak up uh, for the things that are so important to us that assure us of continued quality services by the town I'm here to speak tonight in favor of funding for the Mystic Noank Library, but all libraries. And it was really great to hear these others speak up. I think you can see there's a strong contingency for Mystic Noank. That is because the budget itself that they're requesting is just a small fraction of what they need to operate. But you've got to give them a fighting chance because between members and staff, they need our help to at least have the amount that they've asked for and the rest they raise through donations and it's a tremendous buy for what the town puts into it. I'm not gonna belabor it because it's getting late, but I think this meeting opened up with an ex extremely good example of why the Groton libraries are so important to us wherever they are in town. The young fellow that came up here and spoke how many of you didn't feel what he was saying? I could, I use the library here quite frequently. I'm in the Mystic Noank Library several times a week. But what he stated about opening the doors to the library, and I'm sure you've all done it. You go into the Mystic, this library is like a beehive. I love it, the town library, because I walk in and I think, boy, are we getting our money's worth. Go into the Mystic Noank Library, it's a busy place to the activity rooms and all, but I can push open the doors, go upstairs, and when you open the doors to upstairs, exactly what he described takes place. You enter a sacred area almost, full of books, and you can find a chair, and you can enjoy it and look out over the town. Please meet the minimum requirements of what the libraries are asking for, particularly the Mystic Noank Library. It's an excellent investment in our children, and for seniors. Thank you. Thank you. Sarah Lathrop, followed by Marie Shaw. Thank you. Um, Marie Shaw, followed by Ralph Batty. Marie Shaw, I live at 20 Colony Road, Groton, and I appreciate the opportunity tonight to speak. I chair the board of the Groton Public Library, and I teach library science courses at Three Rivers Community College. I urge you to approve the town manager's 
fiscal 2020 mm -hmm. request for level services funding for the Groton Public Library. Level services funding means only a 1.5% increase over the current budget. Of this, the majority is designate, designated for negotiated contracted um, salaries. In, I'm gonna give you a little history. <laughs> I've been on the board for a while. In 2002, the library budget was slightly under $2 million. The town manager's request for fiscal 2020 is approximately 250,000, a quarter of a million dollars, less than the library budget was 18 years ago. It is without a doubt that the library today provides more services, research support, and community outreach than it did in 2002. How is it able to do so much less with, to do so much more with so much less funding. Over the past 18 years, the library budget has repeatedly been reduced on the backs of its staff. Positions were downgraded, consolidated, and eliminated. Staff is expected to do more with less in ways that are apparently seamless to the residents of Broughton. Did you know that to make budget for this fiscal year 19, a position was eliminated? It is not being restored in the fiscal 2020 budget. In 2002, the Groton Public Library operated budget, operating budget was close to $400,000. The town manager's budget provides $163,000. Do the math. Operations include the purchasing of new books, databases, newspapers, e-books. Um, it includes the supplies, the software, the small equipment, the technology. It's the things that you see, that you use, and you borrow when you go into the library. Can you successfully operate your household on less than half of what you did in uh, 18 years ago? Neither really can the library. There are three key reasons why people use the Groton Public Library. These are its services, its research support, and the outreach to our community. Services include classes in technology, ebooks, and databases, hundreds of educational programs for babies through adults, free computer use, Wi-Fi, interlibrary loan, meeting rooms, museum passes, passport services, quiet study, scanning, photocopying, and of course, the circulating of the books and media from the collections. The second reason people use the library is for our professional librarians. They provide research instruction to both individuals and groups on a variety of topics. They provide us expertise on technology, career services, readers advisory, historical and personal research needs. Finally, did you know that the Groton Public Library provides community outreach? The Groton Municipal TV, <laughs> uh, films and broadcast government meetings, and provides programs to citizens via, via cable or its uh, new um, live YouTube channel. Librarians conduct senior stories and bring books to nursing homes, including a model book buddies interge intergenerational program at Fairview. Librarians visit and collaborate with the schools in Groton, and they actively sponsor children's summer reading programs. Homeschooled families depend on the Groton Public Library, as do our special need patrons. Numerous other outreach opportunities abound, from community, community policing to our nationally recognized One Book, One Region. And you might have been one of those hundreds of people who came last summer to see the solar eclipse out in the parking lot. We are grateful to the active circle of friends that Sue Arabach spoke of, who raise funds and volunteer hundreds of hours each year to support the library. Just one example of their volunteering is that they, they raise the funds for a diaper changing station in the family restroom at the library. There's also those junior friends, and we saw several of them tonight. Um, I think we have over 75 young people who are equally active and supportive of the library. You have one minute. Okay. Grants are written each year for adult and youth programs, technology, and literacy initiatives. However, it is our town council and RTM who have the responsibility to vote a budget that supports the services, research, and community outreach that is essential to Groton today and supports the potential of tomorrow's youth. I urge you to vote for the town manager's proposed level services budget. Anything less would be detrimental to our residents who rely on their Groton Public Library for its services, research, and community outreach. Thank you for time, and thank you for what you do for the town. Thank you. Ralph Batty, followed by Judy Monroe. Good evening. Ralph Batty, 42 Ramsdale Street. If you don't know who I am, 
stop by the Groton Community Center. Monday through Friday, most Saturdays. I teach karate for the Groton Parks and Rec Department uh, now for 23 years. Uh, I've been up at this podium numerous times asking, pleading for a community center. We got one, thank you. Um, I admire the pickleballers coming up here and uh, you know, going to bat. They're the newest members of Parks and Rec. 23 years, 34 classes a week, 11 special events on weekends, two tournaments. One, which was a major last year national event with people traveling from the West Coast to come and compete here in our town. Three through adult, special needs. I run it all. The Parks and Rec runs it all. And the funny thing is I talk about the children I have parents that are now taking class because they see what their, their children are benefiting from it. The senior center is migrating over to the Parks and Rec, to the community center. I have grandparents training in my class now. A year and a half ago, we started here in the music room and we just ran out of space because it became very popular. So now we're in the multi-purpose room at the Grant Community Center which is a wonderful space, except for when it rains, because then we have puddles on the mat from the leaky ceiling. Uh, my children, they drop their mouthpieces on the floor and I'm like, run and wash it, wait, wash it off in the water cooler because they can't drink or use the water because there's lead in it. Um, yeah, we asked for a community center, but we were put in a building that was built in 1928. My father went to high school there, and then it became a middle school. Um, you can put a coat of paint on a condemned building, but it's still a condemned building. Um, we need help because there are major improvements that need to be made with this building. Um, I'm just a small part of this, this big community project that we have there, and every instructor that's in that building is just as passionate as I am about teaching and helping and being an active part of the community. So I'm not here to talk numbers. I'm just here to give facts. Uh, we need help. A lot of you guys have had children in my program. Some of you were children in my program. And uh, I appreciate you uh, hearing me out tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Judy Monroe followed by David Evans. Good evening. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak. I'm here to support the Mystic Knowing Library. Uh, you know, while standing here, I could really tell you about our outstanding and hardworking library staff that see over 100,000 people uh, through our doors every year. Or I could talk about the outstanding programs that are offered to all ages and a variety of interests uh, throughout our community. I could talk about our volunteers uh, who do everything from chasing roof leaks and changing roof tiles to pulling weed or mending books. The reason is we don't have a facilities department, we don't have an HR department, we don't have an IT department. <coughs> Many of these activities at our library depend on the goodness of our volunteers. I could talk about our friends organization who help raise money to continue to support the programs and opportunities that we have and to also volunteer and support events. But I'm not gonna talk about those things. I'm gonna tell you why the Mystic No Ink Library is important to me and to my family. When I moved here five years ago, I sought out the library as a way to orient myself to my newly adopted town. At the library, I learned to download books and sharpen my computer skills. I went to movies, listened to speakers, and met my neighbors. I brought my grandkids. My daughter and grandson, who now live in Mystic, they put together puzzles upstairs in the puzzle corner. They hunt for pumpkins at the pumpkin activity, and they bring a picnic for the outside concert. My grandson has made crafts, come to movies, done yoga, and read to a service dog. He has special needs. And the children's librarian took the time to learn what kind of books that he loved. And she suggested a series that I started reading to him two years ago. 
because they made him laugh. And today, he's reading those books to me, and we laugh together. These are just some of the things and the activities that are offered by the library. And there are hundreds of stories just like mine all over every area of town. Uh, please support the Mystic Knowink Library by recommending the funding as noted by the director's proposed budget. So the Mystic and Knowink Library can continue to be a vibrant part of the growing committee, uh, community. We know that economic growth is very important to this region and we believe that we support that economic growth. Thank you for your time. Thank you. David Evans, followed by Rebecca Noreen. David Evans, 220 High Street in Mystic. And I've been sitting here thinking, what can I add to the plea to support the Mystic and Noank Library? So a couple of things. Um, I've been in this area and participating in, in various things in this community for over 50 years, but I've been lucky enough for the last dozen years to be able to walk to the Mystic and Noank Library. And <laughs> we all need the exercise. Uh, it's, it's just a good thing to be able to do that. But uh, what I can share with you is that this is an incredibly valuable resource to this community. And we heard from the very beginning from the town manager the importance of having an attractive community at a variety of levels. And we are clearly part of that dynamic. Uh, I did spend a few years on the library board. Uh, I'm, this past two and a half years, found out something else that the library does. Uh, through participation jointly uh, with uh, the hospice group from Norwich, um, there's actually a, now up to four meetings a month. It used to be two uh, groups that uh, would meet as a support group. And when my wife passed away two and a half years ago, I went to that and it started with four people and a month later it was down to one person. But today we have 12 to 15 people coming twice a month and participating in that. And it's just another little part of this community that's very valuable. And finally I would just say there's just an incredible amount of volunteer effort. You've heard some of those things, but for example, uh, I believe it's this Friday and Saturday, uh, there will be a tag sale at the library. There's a nearly new book sale at the library every Christmas. Um, there are all sorts of fundraisers going on. There's a June uh, program uh, selling flowers and, and books and things of this sort. So it's not that we're begging for money. We are using money in a variety of ways that are developed by the users of the library, and we really, really need that additional $25,000 that is being whacked out of this year's budget. So I leave you with those thoughts, that this is really an important resource to help to build the town of Croton. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Evans. Rebecca Noreen, followed by Richard Samarara. Hello, I'm Rebecca Noreen, and I actually live at 11 Duns Court in Stonington. But next week, actually it was supposed to be um, tomorrow, but it's going to be next week. I'm closing on a house on 233 High Street in Mystic. So the library is going to be down the street and around the corner from me. So the library is going to be in my future. But that is not what I want to talk to you about, because I've used Mystic and Noak Library for years, and I have an autistic son and it was a safe place for him. And a lot of people have talked about what a sacred place it is. It, it, it's, there's something about it that, makes, that made my son, who was very high anxiety level, um, be able to be in this place and to feel at home. So I'm just, my appeal to you is let's keep the library open for all, not just for the programs or for 
um, the services or anything, but just to keep this place open so that people that do find a home there have a place to go. Thank you. Thank you. Richard Samarero, followed by Mike Whitney. I'm Richard Semerero. I live at 202 High Street in Mystic. Uh, I'm here to support the libraries. I've served on the RTM and cheer, chaired the committee that recommends budget allocations for the libraries. I've been on the board of directors of the Groton Library and an active member of the Friends of the Groton and Mystic Libraries. The most important thing I can do today is to urge you to consider the three libraries as a single library system, even though two of the libraries are operated by nonprofit organizations. Anyone who lives in Groton can take out a library card and use it in any of the three. Most people use the library closest to their home. The Mystic and the Bell, Bill Libraries inject large sums of non-tax raised money into the system from their endowment income and fundraising activities. This is an arrangement that has served us well over the years. When I bought my home in 2004, an important consideration was that it was within walking distance of the Mystic and Noank Library. Since then, my property taxes have gone up substantially, and town support of the Mystic Library has been cut in half. This is like an additional tax on me and others who live in Mystic, because we have to increase our contributions to the library to make up for the lost revenue as best we can. When economic con considerations have caused reductions in the past, we sought to restore them as soon as possible. And that should be our goal this year. Thank you. Thank you. Mike Whitney, followed by Bill Turner. Thank you. Mike Whitney, 112 Deerfield Ridge Drive, Mystic, and I'm RT RTM District 5. So first of all, I commend the department heads, superintendent, board of education, and the town manager for putting together a budget that addresses most of the town's needs and does not increase the mill rate. I do, however, have reservations about adding three new town positions. Rising health care costs will continue to put pressure on the town for the foreseeable future. Adding new people will increase that burden. There has to be a pressing and sustained need to justify the new positions. And that may be the case for the patrol lieutenant, as it will um, offset the need for $94,000 in overtime. As an aside, I believe a combined police force would benefit all of Groton, and I think that should be added to our long-term plan. I think the deputy finance director and the financial assistant positions need further justification. Let's make sure that they're truly necessary. Uh, something I'm sure is truly necessary are ambulance services. The manager's budget cuts the town support by 25% from last year. I urge the town council to add that back in, it's, it's extra $20,000. Overall, the total town support would be less than $2 per resident. That's a bargain for ambulance services. They are a critical part of public safety that we're depending on, and that's not a service that the town duplicates at all. Uh, speaking of safety, we need to get the asbestos out of our schools. I urge support of the asbestos abatement at Fitch. The state will likely refund us for half that cost, and we've put this off for far too long already. So the time to do that is now and during the summer. Uh, progress has been made with lead in our schools, and I'm happy to see that, lead in the drinking water. But the community center has the same problem, as you've already heard. We need safe environments for our children. So I urge support for all the needed um, uh, improvements to the community center. I'm there four days a week, and I assure you the need is real, and it will benefit many, many people. Finally, I urge support for the education budget. The increase of 1.2% is overdue. 
we've been held at the minimum budget requirement, or the MBR, for far too long. As costs go up, keeping the same overall budget slides us backwards. Our per student spending is, and has been, well below the state average for some time. This is one reason that we are an alliance district, the bottom tier of school systems in the state. And the town, town manager, Burt, mentioned the state support cut if, not when, uh, we exit alliance uh, in several years. Are we really on the trajectory to climb out of that? I'm not seeing that yet. To do that, actually, we need to increase support to the schools. And we're talking about the budget and that currency is in dollars. But an investment in the schools pays off in our children's future. And that's the most far-reaching impact we as a town can make. Thank you. Thank you. Bill Turner, followed by Zachary Corvo. I'll put that out a little bit further. Uh, my name is Bill Turner, and I'm representing 150 Library Street, the Mystic and Noank Library, as the uh, president of their board of trustees. I have a great team that uh, works tirelessly for that library uh, to make that engine run well. But I'm here also to represent all libraries across the town of Groton. Uh, my pet, of course, is the Mystic Noank Library and is dear to me. Uh, we have many volunteers and friends of that library that work tirelessly to make things happen. Uh, in, a, in another couple of weeks from now, we'll transform the landscape at that library with volunteers and people from the Groton community. Uh, we'll, I'll, I'll ditch this nice jacket and, and jump into a dump truck to make sure it's full and, and we'll prune the place and, and that'll be done all with volunteers for the benefit of that community. Uh, I saw the cuts to the Mystic and Noah Library and because I am the board trustee, I'm very sensitive to those cuts, knowing the value of what that library brings to this community and to the town of Groton. I don't think when it comes to libraries that there should be any winners or losers. I think as counselors, you know that libraries build strong communities, whether it be the Bill Memorial Library, whether it be the Mystic and Noank Library, or whether it be the Groton Municipal Library across the parking lot here. I'm a former educator. I know the value that libraries bring to school systems, after school programs, to youth, to seniors, to teenage students and learning. I request that the drastic budget cuts that in my viewpoint were singled for the Mystic and Noah Library be restored and that we continue to build that community across Groton for libraries. You know, professionally I do real estate work and what I do know each day when I talk to that new person that's coming in and being recruited by electric boat, they're looking for certain things in their community because these are the people, the millennials, that have the fluidity to move wherever they want within one year, two year, three per year period. But what they say to me often, they want to know about the school system. I direct them to the superintendent's office. They want to know about, is there a, a, a library in the community? Is there a gym in the community? What types of things are in that community that will make it attractive to me? We all know across this counselor table that the Mystic and Low Knowing Library serves both the Groton and the Stonington communities. But it's hosted right within the jewel of all of us, Mystic. Every person buying a piece of real estate in this region, luckily for the town of Groton, is Mystic if they can afford it. The highest, my guess, from what I read in the tax base, are those properties that directly surround the Mystic and Knowing Library. And my feeling is, for those large tax rates, that often they get the least as far as services from their local community library. The Mystic and Noah Library for decades has provided programs for young children, middle school students, and the elderly. Libraries go hand in hand with vibrant communities, as I mentioned. From a real estate perspective, it's one of the number one things they look at outside of the educational system. The educational system has, has to be strong. And lucky, luckily for us here, as realtors in the town of Groton, from a numbers perspective, out of total Eastern Connecticut, people are looking at the Mystic community for housing when they're coming to new jobs. I found it interesting that many people mentioned tonight that the, the town of Groton views the Mystic Noink Library and the Bill Memorial Library as outside agencies 
as if they were a private contract that you could kind of line out of the budget. These are valuable institutions that are the very fabric of this community, and they should be preserved and not cut to the, the level that you're looking at at this point. It's just, it's bad for communities. It's bad for me getting paid from a real estate agent to, to know. So uh, I am minute, here. Sir. I have one more minute? Yes. Okay, good. Uh, I'll just say earlier, someone said that they're not here to beg. I'm here to beg, <laughs> and, uh, and I won't be <laughs> proud about it. We need to support those libraries, all of the libraries, all of the schools within the district, not cherry picking which ones win and which ones lose. Thanks for listening. Thank you. Zachary Corvo, followed by Seth Fisher. How many more? <laughs> Hello. Zachary Corvo, 29 Mariners Lane, Mystic, Connecticut. My name is Zachary, and I've been training with Sensei Ralph from Parks and Rec since I was three. I am now nine, and these three years of training, I have been made both a better person and karate student. But I am not the only one that does karate. My family is devoted to karate because after I started, my sister was quick to sign up. After her, my younger brother signed up, and recently my mom has too, and they are really enjoying it. Also, some of my greatest friends are my friends because I met them at karate. At the national competition, I even made friends from Idaho. I feel the dojo can be a great environment for parents and kids alike. I have become a much better person in my years at karate, and part of the reason for that is because Sensei Ralph works hard to teach us the traits in our dojo-kun. Discipline, effort, integrity, and self-control. But he can't do that easily with the poor conditions we are given. The water at the Groton Community Center is not safe to drink. The walls are scratched and dented. The mirrored paint on the windows is falling off. When it rains, the roof leaks, and I recently learned that there are ants and bugs in the building. These are the reasons that I am asking you here as members of my town council to please fund the Grand Parks and Rec to the right amount of money that they need. If you want to see firsthand what our karate is like, we are having a tournament on Saturday at the Grand Community Center. Both me and my little sister will be competing. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Seth Fisher, followed by Dane Stevenson. <clears throat> My name is Seth Fisher, and I live at 78 Hunting Ridge Drive, Mystic, Connecticut, and I'm here to support the improvements for the Deer Deerfield Neighborhood Basketball Court. I'd like to start by saying I'm very grateful for the playground that we have in our neighborhood. And I do realize, and we do realize, that many neighborhoods do not have this privilege of having an outlet to go outside and be active. Teenagers are provided or presented with a bad rap for not being involved in the community and not being active and indulged in their technology lives. Our park is specifically basketball is highly utilized to this point, and any improvements to this would be greatly appreciated, and the community would thank you greatly. Thank you. Thank you. Dane Stevenson, followed by Erica Lombardi. Dane Stevenson, 30th Theodore Can Ave, uh, also representing on the RTM District 3. I could come up here, talk about the library, about the community center, um, about the various cuts we've made to uh, personnel in the town, but I'd only be talking about symptoms of what's really going on here, which is something it doesn't quite fit exactly, but it's called austerity. It's when you try to make cuts to, so you're not having to pay so much things. I look here on page 11 of the budget, and it does says here that the town does have a lot of potential construction likely to occur over the next few years, with the prime example being electric boat, but the resulting tax revenues will be stifled for a number of years, either five or 10 years, depending on the state award, due to the likelihood of being granted an enterprise zone designation. Why are we giving tax breaks to a company that makes multiple billion dollars of profit every year? We need to understand, and maybe we do need to increase taxes to help pay for the things, but I was doing a quick bit of research about this enterprise zone thing, and it's to entice companies to build in areas that are underprivileged or underfunded. How do you think those areas get that way? 
it's from cutting spending in the community. It's people leaving because there's not the services they want there. Uh, I understand that people don't want their taxes to go up, but when you look at a piece of paper and it just says, you know, this position cut, this person's pay goes down, those are human beings. And by putting numbers, we sterilize, but these are people in our community. These are people that work for this town. They do something to contribute to all the services that we have. So I am in support of not only stopping cuts, but increasing funding, because that's money that goes back into our community. That's money that gets spent at our restaurants, uh, at various locations uh, for recreational purposes. Uh, we are a community, and, that, and we are stronger as a community than we are as individuals. So yes, I understand people have a self-interest to not see their taxes go up, they want to spend that money for another vacation or maybe put it more in the bank, but you have to understand that we are stronger as a community. Uh, as Hobbes said, uh, life for man before community, I'm paraphrasing a bit here, was short and brutish. And that's why we form communities in the first place, because we are stronger together. And that means, yes, that we have to contribute towards that community. And that's all I wanted to say. Thank you. Thank you. Erica Lombardi. Erica Lombardi, 33 Eldrickin Avenue. I'm here in support of the Bill Memorial Library. I just want to point out that the bill is not a duplicate library. It's here to support its uh, community. I understand we have multiple libraries, but the bill is not only a library, it's a historical piece we need to keep. It's the original library, and in the winter, when the, um, the fort is closed, where do people go to find information on the fort? They go to the Bill Memorial Library. Not only that, but the Bill Memorial is uh, great with the community during Christmas time with secret, or not secret, sing along with Santa, we had 250 individuals pass through the library. Not all at once, we had them pass through, I understand there are fire codes. Um, and we have the Bunny Bonanza coming up in April. I'm sorry, I've been, a, I'm also a friend of the Bill Memorial Library. Unfortunately, I haven't been able to physically volunteer there, but I do go to meetings and I take care of the social media. Um, I, the Bill Memorial is the heart of that area, of the Fort Griswold area of the community, and it's basically my entire world. Um, my, uh, my existence revolves around this library, and I do this because when I was not living in Groton, my brother had nowhere to go. My brother was homeless. He would sleep on couches, and during the day, he would spend time at the Bill Memorial Library. This was happened so frequently that when I moved back to Groton and I came to the Bill Memorial Library, I was asked, are you Dylan Lombardi's sister? And the answer is yes. Without this library, my brother would have nothing. Without this library, I wouldn't have the friends I have. Um, it just means so much to me, and I know it means so much to our community. I uh, just want to pull up some information. I actually had to text one of the librarians because I was not prepared to speak, but no one would speak, so here I am. Um, the Bill Memorial has over a thousand attendees during the summer reading. Uh, we, they, they do their best to chase down after donations and grants. My, my friend Kate spends hours writing grants for the library. They are doing their best, but they need the community's support um, because they have been supporting the community for over 130 years. Um, they're trying really hard to focus on the future, and I can't speak for the board, I can't speak for the director, but I do know they try, they, their attempt is to push forward to be a historical library. And it, the library is part of Groton's history, period. And that's really all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you very much. That is all we have signed up for this evening. Is there anyone else here who wished to speak? If you could come up to the microphone, please, and state your name and address. And I need to record it, so you'll have to be patient with me so I can write it down, please. Okay, sure. Um, my name is Laura Cotto. I live at 55 Grove Avenue, C-O-T-T-O. -T -T -O. And what was the address, please? 55 Grove Avenue. Thank you. I am a City of Groton resident, a parent of children attending district schools, 
and work locally in the field of infant mental health. I'm here tonight to highlight the importance of services offered by all of the libraries, but I'm going to speak about the Bill Memorial Library specifically. I've been going to this library since I was a child and continue to this day. In my first year of college, I became a young mother. I had to drop out of school, and my now husband worked three jobs to support us as I stayed home with this new tiny human and no car. I felt completely isolated during that time, and at the same time, desperate to continue my education as I knew it was the key to building a better life for my family. Each week, I strapped my baby girl into her stroller and walked to the library from my house near William Seeley School. We attended story times and socialized with other families, and I slowly took courses, one at a time, researching and typing papers on their computers. Soon, the library staff knew us well, and they recommended books, taught me new technology, and sometimes entertained my child as I slowly earned my associate's degree, my bachelor's, and finally my master's. My children have grown to be wonderful students and avid readers thanks to those countless hours spent at the library. I now oversee a home visiting program for parents considered to be at risk. Many of these families face barriers and challenges in their everyday life. These families also walk to the library and find resources and connection within its walls. As we move toward building a strong community center, I worry for families on my side of town. We have recently lost Pleasant Valley School and rec programs at William Seeley. I hope you will recognize the value in the libraries. I urge you to continue to pro provide adequate funding to enable access to these imperative services. Thank you. Thank you. I saw another hand. Ah, come on up. Uh, Michael Whitehouse, um, 600 Meridian Street Extension, apartment 1005. Also the representative for District 4 on the RTM. So I've been listening to all this about the libraries. And I uh, first, um, Mr. Bird, do I want to thank you for all your effort in I know the, it's a massive undertaking to prepare our budget every year. And I want to thank the town council for all of your work, which I know is often thankless. And however it turns out, I appreciate all your efforts. Um, but I do want to comment on the libraries and the outside agencies. So 24.19 is the mill rate that we're aiming for. Sorry, 24.17. 24.19 is what it would be if we funded the libraries. So very small difference that we're looking at between funding and not funding the, outs <clears throat> the outside agencies. So a lot of people don't realize I moved here in 2014, fairly recently. And when I came to town, some of my first impressions were the three libraries we have and being very impressed by them. Um, now, some people say that it's redundant. We have three libraries. Why do we need three libraries? You know, a lot of other towns have one library. Well, we have 41,000 people. <clears throat> Excuse me, getting, getting allergies. Or I'm allergic to Connecticut, I'm not sure which. But we have 41,000 people. That's three times as many people as a lot of the towns out there that only have one library. So on a per capita basis, we have the right number of libraries. Plus, you know, each one serves its area, and each one also serves its own unique niche and its own unique purposes. And when we consider them as outside agencies, they're really not. Um, it's an outside agency in the sense that it's not all our tax money that pays for the bill and the, the mystic knowing, but that really just means we're getting a great deal. We're paying a very small amount of money to get a very large amount of value. And so there's a multiplier effect on the very small amount of money that we are spending, you know, 0 0.02 percent, or 0 0.02 mil points, I guess we call them. Um, to get the full benefits of two additional libraries. And that's the kind of thing that brings people to this town. That's what raises our property values, which is what in turn creates our property taxes. So I would encourage the town council to fully fund the libraries, at least at the 2019 level, so they can continue to maintain the same level of services and the same level of benefits. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else who'd like to speak? Portia Bordelon, 159 Chanacasa Parkway. Wasn't prepared to speak, but 
just want to thank everybody involved that touches this budget from beginning to end. I know it's not an easy task, and where do I stand? Where I could throw out my opinion, who cries the loudest, what, what do we want to fund? I encourage the town council and the town manager in future and the current RTM to look at the town as a whole. Where can we better serve everybody on every side of town, on every part and every side of this town? Also the safety and the well-being and quality of the town. For example, looking at CIPs, things that are long overdue, how long have they been coming up, what needs to be restructured. One that comes to mind to me is the tennis courts at the high school. As, as I see the 1.2% increase for the um, school budget, I am concerned with that end of it, uh, considering we have an MBR requirement, which means that number we will have it for next year. Looking at the merge of the, two, of the two middle schools, there's supposed to be a decrease. So I'm curious as to how we can consolidate and look at that. Reviewing the budget, I also have noticed that on the school budget, line by line, there are items that I'm not looking to cut education necessarily. I'm asking our education department to spend wisely. Once again, it's not a cut to education. I'm encouraging how we utilize that money per student in the district, district-wide. There's things like in the budget, and I could read all day, line by line, it, it's, it goes on with, uh, you know, the travel costs for teachers for enrichment. What, uh, I was at meetings and some people brought that up and nobody wanted to cut it. Why can't we cut there? Um, that once again wouldn't be a direct impact on the students. One year without enrichment is not going to cripple a town. So I, I believe there's more in the, the school budget that can be cut. Where we lack is remedial support. So even though we approve a budget of 1.2%, I forget the other number uh, right now, uh, we, we have no control on the school budget as to where the school decides to, to allocate those funds, hire new people, give people raises, increases. So I, I encourage the, the Board of Ed and the, the, the um, superintendent to really look at those lines and look at ways that we can move that money that's going to directly impact the student. We have amazing staff in this district that serve our students, but they're only as good as the power and the, in the, in the, the uh, resources that you give them to work with, and we do lack resources. Looking at our recent report with our uh, uh, next generation science coming up, we're lacking a, a, a foundation program at the high school. It's newly coming on board, um, but currently there's no textbooks in there. It's in uh, trial mode. Everything's still in trial mode. The lead water in our schools. I want to make sure that the building is structurally sound in reference to the community service building. We can't have water coming in on the floor on the kids. Hearing that tonight, if that's actually true, I will do my research as a representative um, RTM member in District 2. That was one of the first things as an RTM member that I was tasked with to approve when it came before us was, do we want to make that a community uh, rec building? And I agreed. And one of the comments that I raised was, can you check the water? And now the water had come back the way that it is. We can approve things, but we have to support them. In this town, I feel structurally also another thing with the schools. We, you we, build, thank you. we build schools, but we don't preserve them. We need to maintenance them. We have mold issues at Nor uh, Cath uh, Northeast Academy, lead at the high school. That school was just rebuilt. How is there lead in the water? We need to take care of our properties in a way that are going to move us into further years and not band-aid issues. As far as our, our sports facility, facilities at the uh, high school, is, I might not be for the, the increase in the, um, uh, their budget for the Board of Ed, but I feel our sports facilities, facilities in this town lack. If you look around us, we're the only school that does not have a turf field. Ledger is in the final proposal phase. Our tennis courts lack. Our field house has lead in it. Our concession stand had lead in it. Once again, another thing that I had raised and then it was tested. I feel that we have an accountability to provide safe environment for our students. Drinking water should have been done. It's been almost three years now. We shouldn't be bringing this up. So once again, I do encourage you guys, I know you're tasked with the library and everything else. I know you'll make the right decisions, but I just encourage that you think of the town as a whole, look at the safety concerns, the structural concerns, the well-being of the children, and the whole community at large, seniors included. Thank you again, and I, I, I wish you guys the best of luck with it. Thank you. Thank you. Last call. I'm sorry. Here.
Okay, are there any other speakers this evening? Okay, we received, the town council received several letters in the mail um, and they are um, with all of the council members here. So thank you very much to all those who wrote to us. Um, seeing no further public comment, I'll accept a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. Second. Moved by Atwater, seconded by Parker. All those in favor of adjournment say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstaining? So moved unanimously. We are adjourned at 921. Thank you very much for coming out.